Okay, what I'd like to do is while we have people lining up, literally, I'm gonna give you each one minute. <laughs> if, can you do it if you just take a minute to respond while people are standing up to ask questions? Okay, or make right. comments. I'm sorry? Or make comments. Or make comments, yes, yes, please. So, go ahead. Go well, uh, I don't have a lot of response. We could go, I'm sure John and I would have a lot of fun for the rest <laughs> of the day on this. I think that your problem is much more complicated than some of what you've heard here because you're going to get cases where you have three defendants in a groundwater litigation and one contributed TCE and one contributed PCBs and the other contributed dioxins. Very different substances, different sets of epidemiology, huge packages of studies out there. Different doses do different things. They cause different endpoints. That's the cases you're going to get. They're not two fires or three fires. And it's in this world, in toxic tort world, it's very difficult for judges to figure out how to decide what's trivial and what's not. I think, Professor Green, I don't want to pretend to read your mind, but I think you were doing it at sort of a gut level. It was sort of a gut call that 0.001 is too low. But how do you make that call? I mean, what if every exposure in the case is below 0.1? Would you make the same call or not? And I, my recommendation is to follow the science. Uh, there is good science out there, epidemiology studies and others, where the scientists wrestle with this information. I get concerned when courts try to get ahead of the scientific community and let things go through that have not been fairly well pinned down in the scientific world. Yeah, I guess my reaction to, to um, the comment is, I think the two fires scenario is not as um, uh, instructive <laughs> in asbestos. I think it's because it, you're dealing with a poison, essentially, and it's not like the cases that Bill just mentioned, where you have different cause, causative factors causing different diseases. In a mesothelioma case, if every judge in this room put a small amount of cyanide in my glass, I'm not suggesting you do this, although there may be a, a groundswell of, of, of movement for that, and I drank it, then I think that the, the combination of the cyanide that would, would kill me has been contributed to by everyone, and the solution for the issue of what happens with someone who's less culpable is why God invented contribution. <laughs> okay, great. Do we have any comments or questions? Good morning. I'm a bankruptcy judge in Chicago. My question uh, deals with the collective treatment of uh, many of these torts either through bankruptcy plans or through class actions. Uh, we've been reading about how uh, some of the trusts have been uh, drained faster than anticipated because some of the smaller cases received compensation before the larger ones or the more serious ones. Does the science inform the judge who is supervising the establishment of a class action trust or a bankruptcy plan trust as to how that should be administered. All right, do you have any experience in those areas? Um, I, for better or worse, I spend about 80% of my time on these asbestos bankruptcy trusts. And I, I too read the Wall Street Journal article. Uh, and usually when I read the Wall Street Journal about asbestos, it's, it's through the looking glass stuff. Um, in fact, most, uh, frankly, something I've been an advocate for almost endlessly, in the asbestos trust distributions, the monies available to non-malignant cases and the cancers are subject to an absolute collar. In other words, regardless of how many non-malignant cases should come to the trust, it may not access money set aside for the mesothelioma and cancer cases. The, it, it ranges depending on when the trust was established, but the, the current division from just a strict monetary value is about 87% to the cancers and 13% to the non-malignants. Uh, the issue in terms of whether or not a particular trust has a lot of assets to pay, frankly, recently has been a function of the market. They have assets, they are invested. Some of them owns Corning and the Armstrong World Industries in particular, own large blocks of stock in the company. And as the building products industry has been beaten down, their assets are less, their ability to make current payments are less, although most of the money being paid is to cancer victims. Um, I don't have as much experience with trust, so I'm probably the wrong person to try to answer this. I, my feeling for the trust is that what happens in those has more to do probably with policy than it does with science. I think you're making hard calls about how to exclude or include people. 
Um, my recommendation would be that there are some basics on the science that should definitely be included. For instance, almost everyone agrees that lung cancer is not an asbestos-caused disease unless the dose is substantially high, and, and the trust ought to be acknowledging that and not simply allowing uh, all lung cancers in. Uh, beyond those, you're going to run into a lot of disputes over what the science really says if you get down into the, the difficult areas, and I think it's, t it's more of a policy call at that point. Go ahead. Uh, can I uh, do kind of a follow-up on a similar, somewhat related topic? Our court hears vaccine compensation cases. Or actually, we have a core of special masters that hear them, and we review them. And that model, at least, that Congress was looking at about 10 years ago and uh, came to our court with the, at least asking us for whether we could hear them. The numbers were really way too large, and nothing came of the bill. But is that a viable idea, not only for asbestos, but for other toxic torts to have some kind of compensation scheme to the extent that you are having 100 or 1,000 con uh, companies contribute, you're really talking about the society and shouldn't the risk be distributed across the society by some compensation scheme? Well, let me say something in response to that would be, that I expect would be unpopular with both Bill and John, but it, it's really a crime that Congress didn't, and it should have been before the late 90s, it should have been in the early 80s, um, get together and come up with a compensation scheme that first of all would have said with regard to the plural plaques, no, you guys wait. What we're going to take is, and Peter Shuck a number of years ago wrote an article about this in which he's, the title of which is, The Worst Should Go First. That is, the mesothelioma victims that, that John is representing, those are the ones who should have been compensated initially. The asbestosis people who had clinical symptoms should have been compensated to the extent they had real harm. And the others should have been told, wait a second, wait a second. And I don't think we would have run out of money, or if we did, we would have run out of money much less slowly if we had, the good, had had the good sense to do that. And that really took legislation. And to a large extent, it, it was going to require legislation on a federal level. Uh, Congress, I would condemn Congress for not having taken this bull by the horns. The other thing that it would have done, of course, is to have squeezed out the transaction costs, which I always say to my students, you should love transaction costs. Remember, that's the money that you're going to make as a lawyer. That's transaction costs. We could have squeezed the transaction costs that also took away money available for asbestos victims. Very unfortunate in my view. And if there were an opportunity to do that on a smaller level, and I'm not sure there is, if there were, I'd be all in favor of it in asbestos. I spent three years of my life in Washington under this so-called FAIR Act. Anytime Congress comes up with a name like that, you've got to get worried. And, and <laughs> I was a Johnny One Note on this issue. If you want to put plaintiff's lawyers, defense lawyers out of business, do it. If you want to compensate the people with these diseases, do it. If you want to have people contribute the money, do it. But have them really send the money. Deposit it in the Federal Reserve Bank in New York and have the money there. Instead, we were presented with a a scheme that said, here will be the levels of compensation, and we will get to the funding after the bill passes. I was unwilling to go down that road. In retrospect, I find that the major contributors who were going to provide the money for these people, such as General Motors and Chrysler, perhaps their word was not as good as their intentions. As a follow-up to that question, has there been any analysis between the causation issues between tort actions and workers' compensation occupational disease? You want to take that sure. one? I'm not aware of any. I'm not aware of an analysis. Um, uh, causation in court uh, has historic rules that govern what needs to happen there and we're you know we're all bound by those and we have to play by those again workers compensation like the vaccine cases has a, in my mind a lot of policy behind it that has to do with what causes and what can't be but if either of you ran across an analysis comparing the two and how those causation standards work no analysis comparing the two of course the the two are different right one question is whether the, the workers comp question is whether it arose out of employment right Whereas in tort, it's going to be whether it arose out of the defendant's tortious conduct. 
those are two different questions and of course two different people, two different players, right? Em employers as opposed to defendants. And, and scientifically, the reason for the blank look on my face, in, in my jurisdiction in Illinois, in order to recover for an underworkman's compensation, one must have been exposed to the product within three years, which typically, given the latency period, uh, almost all asbestos cases in Illinois don't have a comp claim because they simply were exposed in their 40s and 50s and they're getting the disease in their 60s, 70s. Last question. Yes, uh, I was wondering whether the U.S. Supreme Court Daubert and Kumho Tires case has impacted the presentation of expert witnesses on these state cases in asbestos-related uh, litigation. I mean, are experts being excluded, or was the science well established beforehand so the experts are still able to testify? That's a good question. I can start on that one. They have influenced it quite a bit. Um, you didn't see it immediately in 1993. It took some years to get to that point. But the slide that I showed you with those states on it, every one of, well, most of those are either Daubert Fry rulings or substantial evidence rulings uh, that came in after the experts testified and are heavily colored by what the experts were doing. Uh, you'll see a great variation, though, as you run across the landscape of our country as to how stringent, strenuous the, the courts are handling those issues. Uh, Florida, for instance, has a, a very generous fry standard, and it's very difficult to get these issues teed up in Florida. Uh, other states that apply Daubert or various forms of Daubert ha are willing to look past what the expert just says. And to me, that's always the, the fundamental point. Instead of just looking at what the expert says, you have to pull the screen aside a little bit and look at the studies they're relying on and the data that they're saying support their testimony and ask, do they match up? And that's what Daubert does. So in general, we do a little better in Daubert states than Fry states in trying to get judges to look at these issues. But it's been very, very important. So has it impacted plaintiff's experts more than defendant's experts? Yes, although there are motions going both directions, and there are some defense experts who have been excluded for certain types of theories as well. Uh, I've seen more of that recently, more attempts by the plaintiffs to file motions against defense experts, but the world is still, I don't know what you would say, John, it's probably 80, 20 percent. It's very, very heavy on the defense side. I, I, th I think it's wildly, many more, and I won't be cynical and say that the lawyers working by the hour file more motions, uh, and, the, and the plaintiff's lawyers want to, want to get to trial. but. Uh, for instance, the classic example on the idiopathic mesothelioma, if I were to file, a, 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 Illinois is a fry state, but if I were to file the motion to get him excluded, I would hurt myself. The, the expert, when it comes out that he's trying to claim that, the, the, that this, this is an idiopathic mesothelioma with all this asbestos exposure, it helps my case. Thanks. Okay, great. Please thank the panelists. Thank you. Thank you.